Nice to have you here. We've got a lot of questions for you, so let's get rolling. First Thanks, one, uh, as a general overview, and we're getting a lot of questions like this into the newsroom. When will it be safe for California to reopen? Let's start with medically the first wave or partial reopening. Yeah, it's a it's a really great question, and you know I'm I'm appreciative. There are a lot of really brilliant thinkers on this. You know, people from medicine, public health, commerce, all kind of doing their best to to understand that. And I think I think what we know now is that the approach to reopening will probably have to be some sort of a graded approach, right? So it's going to be have to be an approach which balances the need to not overwhelm the hospital systems and also to get our economy back to work um, while keeping those people that are most vulnerable safe. And so again, when I say a graded approach, that likely will mean having people go back to work who are quote unquote, more essential and more healthy and less, less likely to get ill. And while at the same time monitoring the hospital systems and I think as the governor alluded to a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. having an ample testing in place to make sure that if an outbreak does occur that we can get our arms around it quickly. Okay, the next one coming in. Uh, the governor has cleared hospitals to start elective surgeries. Is this safe for patients and for doctors? It's a really, it's a really good question. And we, we've thought a lot about that. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of things that, that, you know, at least at Kaiser Permanente, that's a, the system I work in and I can speak to that, that we've really begun to, to do some safety work on and, and, and have a good plan around. And that is, you know, one is the idea of making sure the patients who are coming in, number one, are, are symptom free. Number two, the, there is a lot of discussion around um, whether testing should happen before surgeries, elective surgeries, and that's probably something that you'll see take place. And then the, the other part of that is, is just really keeping that personal protective equipment part up at top level as we do the operations. And, and we do know that if you use the personal protective equipment in the right ways, um, and that we use, we use utmost caution that the, the risk is actually quite low to both the doctors, nurses, teams, and, um, and the patients themselves. Okay, we're with Dr. Chris Walker. Uh, let's go to our next text coming in. Uh, does the presence of antibodies suggest that maybe you're immune to COVID-19? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I think it's one that's been in the, in the news a lot. And I think that the jury's out and I'll answer, let me answer that two ways. So what we know about other corona type viruses, MERS, SARS, some of these ones from the past, is that when people have had those, they typically have been immune for one to two years afterwards. What we don't know about this particular virus is if it has that same type of immunity pattern when you've had it. And so the, again, what'll be useful as we get more and more antibody testing available is as people develop those antibodies, we'll be able to track them and see if they in fact get sick or don't get sick another time. I think. I think again, time will tell and, and a little bit more data will tell on that. All right, next one coming in and, and people who have had flu uh, this year or something uh, worse than that, the text is, I had H1N1 in February. Could I still get COVID-19 or are there some antibodies that have been built up from that? Yeah, gosh, unfortunately, um, they're, they're really two different viruses and the, the antibody response and protection for one probably doesn't protect from the other. And again, you know, I, I, I don't try to speak in concrete terms about this virus. I think if anything, it's, it's made us very humble. Um, you know, and then there had been some reports that potentially that, that response could have had some protection, but I, I don't think concretely we could say that protection from one virus or from one virus would confer protection for another. All right, we're with uh, Dr. Chris Walker, Kaiser Permanente. Next one coming in. Do blood pressure meds that I'm taking interfere with coronavirus treatments? Oh, that's a good. That's a good question. You know, there again, there. I don't know that we have enough data on coronavirus. You know, so to really answer that question concretely, um, we we would have to have studied people on blood pressure medicine who had been exposed to coronavirus. And again, that, that kind of data is not out there. What I will say anecdotally is that risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, those risk factors can all put people at higher risk for getting sick from coronavirus. I don't know that the medicines themselves would increase the risk, but I, I don't know that that answer is concretely out there either. Okay, next one coming in for uh, Dr. Walker. Uh, I have been on blood thinners, I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Does that put this person in that high risk category, which should be very concerned about getting COVID-19? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The presence of blood thinning medicines themselves 
is not likely something that would be a risk factor category. It would really be the condition that that created that. And so, you know, a lot of people who are on blood thinning medicines are on. So for heart conditions like atrial fibrillation or blood clots or things like that. And so some of those conditions may place you in a high risk category. Being on the medicine themselves um, won't necessarily put you there, but that's again, that's a good discussion with um, someone's physician as we mm -hmm. start to ferret out what those categories are.